Welcome to UK Business Show, UK's premier business show where we feature business thought leaders, high achievers, and industry experts. Today's episode is brought to you by World Outsourcing Solutions Limited, a company that specializes in helping executive business owners with virtual assistant services and business growth systems. Here's your host, UK Kachidori. Hi guys, welcome to this very special episode and I'm excited about today because I have a very special guest. What I like about today is you're going to discover how you as a business owner can prepare to retire even now or many years ahead and have the benefit. Now before I do that, let me ask you a few questions. Have you ever caught yourself daydreaming about someone buying your business so you could just escape your business issues? Or maybe You've caught yourself thinking, oh, shall I sell my business and maintain the lifestyle that I have? But you still don't have an answer. Well, today, you're going to discover how you can start managing or planning for your retirement today. Jim, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. Incredible. Like most entrepreneurs, Jim has an electric background ranging from uh, CPA, franchise, Anthony, business owner, consultant, and many others. And what I particularly like about Jim today is he has successfully completed 11,000 coaching sessions with business owners. And one of the things that he's done is he's created uh, what we call a half-retire blueprint, which is a step-by-step process that helps business owners create a profitable alternative to selling their businesses by half retirement. Jim, once again, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Excited to be here. Now, for those who haven't uh, come across you, Jim, uh, very briefly, tell us what you've done over the years and uh, what you're about. Well, I'm the world's, I started off as the world's least successful lawyer. Uh, in law <laughs> school, I realized after a semester that that wasn't going to be for me, but I did finish and I did pass the bar. And you can guess to the penny how much money I've ever made as a lawyer. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> Zero. I've never made a dollar as a lawyer. I got into business in law school, stupidly ran uh, both businesses for two out of the three years of law school. They grew pretty nicely. Um, and then once I was out of law school, I said, you know, I don't know if I want to do this full time. So I sold those, started another, sold that. Typical entrepreneurial story. But I, I got involved with business peer groups along the way. Actually, when I was an owner of a manufacturing company. And I really believed in those mastermind groups. And that's where those 11,000 sessions have come from. It's from uh, some of my members that are members of my peer groups. And I've created an organization around uh, North America that does that as well. But during those, you know, I've written three books. This is the third one, but the, the first one's called The 51 Fatal Business Errors and How to Avoid Them. And those started by me seeing clients doing the same stuff that I did that I wish I could undo. And I call it the school of hard knocks. Right. And that we're all enrolled in the school of hard knocks the day you start your business, whether you want to be or not. And you learn things the slow and painful way instead of the fast and easy way. Right. Well, I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if we could avoid that? That's so why I started just writing stuff down. Oh, this, oh, this, oh, this. And then five years later, there, there was a book, uh, you know, of how, how to avoid those errors. But the same type of thing happened with half retire that I started seeing a similar problem with business owners. And it really was two types of business owners. Business owner type number one was what I will call the unsellable business. And I don't mean it can't be sold. Right. I mean, it can't be sold for what it needs to be sold for. Right. So I'll give you an example. I'm going to use U.S. dollars, so we'll, you, you'll have to run the translation. For yeah, that's good. But let's <laughs> say that I run a nice 30-person plumbing company or HVAC company. Yeah. And I pull $350,000 a year out of it, which is a decent living. Yeah. Okay? But I don't have $5 million sitting in the bank. I have this business that pays for, my, pays for a very nice life that I want. And so I go, oh, you know what? I, I want to get off the ground. I'm going to go sell the business. So I head down to the business broker and they do a little for, informal evaluation. And I go, I'm pretty sure we can get you a million one for this business. You know, about three times earnings, typically what a lot of small businesses sell for. Yeah. And then I run the math and I go, well, wait a minute. By the time I pay the broker and by the time I pay the accountants and the lawyers and the taxes that are going to be due on this sale, I'm going to have maybe 800000 
maybe seven <laughs> from this. And I go, well, gosh, that's only two years. What do I do the other 25 years for money? Yes. You know, what, what am I going to make return on $800,000? Maybe I uh, catch a good stock or get, maybe I lose half of it as well. But with no more income, you start to get a lot more conservative. Saw it with my parents. My family was entrepreneurs. I saw them get big piles of money, and it turned into a small pile of money by being too conservative Yes. with that money. So the first one has a problem in that uh, it's what the exit community calls the value gap, meaning this is how much I need to retire. This is how much I can sell my business for. How do you close that gap? Yes. And half retirement closes that gap. It's the real magic trick that it forms because even if you don't have to retire forever, you have to retire for five more years. I've now got $350,000 for five more years. Incredible. Was a great plan. $1.7 million right there. And guess what my business is worth five years from now? Even more. Probably more. <laughs> because a business owner that can be there a couple half days a week has a much better business than someone that is chained to their desk all the time. Indeed. And no one wants to buy that business. You know, because it's like, well, I don't want to buy your problems. But people think when they're selling their business, they're shedding their problems or, or that someone is paying them to take on all my stuff, but I just want to do this. And that's not the way it works. You have to you have to buy your properties back. If I sell you my problem weighted business, you're I'm paying you to take my problems Incredible. in form of a discount. Yes. Right? And that's the, where the value gap comes from. So we're gonna close the value gap while we're extracting another you, you, almost two million dollars from it. You know, Jim, uh, what you just shared right there for those who are listening, I know this personally because uh, one of my closest family members just went through that, and at the end of uh, selling the business, you know, you could see that they did not make as much money as they anticipated. Had they planned the retirement out, like we're talking about right now, it would be a different story. So this is uh, really true. Yeah, we have a name for that. We call it crossing the bridge of disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and you know why? You know, there's an old saying, people don't sell businesses for money, they sell them because they're frustrated. Wow. And so she probably, I mean, I was a little bit there with my first business. And I was young. I didn't need the money. But I think of what I sold that for, three times earnings, I would have been way better off. I could still be pulling a couple hundred thousand dollars a year out of that business today if I would have kept it. Indeed. You know, instead, I took, I, I took you know, what seemed like a lot of money at 25. <laughs> but in retrospect, I was far better off with the asset that produced income than I was a lump sum of cash. Indeed. You know what? This right. explains very well why, you know, some people just focus on buying businesses because uh, they can put it right. And that they're just taking someone's frustration. They've got a system of streamlining it. It works. It's incredible. Well, right. Think about it. Where else can you make 33% on your money? Well, what other investment can you consistently make a 33% return on your money? And there, there isn't one. Incredible. I know about. If you know, you need to send me a chat right now of where I can <laughs> successfully invest my money for 35% till the end of time. You know, if business owners would understand the concept we're talking about, they will, you know, avoid that mistake of going that route. Now, in your uh, helping people for the last, uh, I don't know how many years, uh, what sort of myth around half retiring that you've come across? Well, I, I think it kind of leads into the second reason that people have retired. And, and so I think that when people get to a certain age, that whole gold watch thing that our parents had, oh, well, you're going to give you a gold watch and you're going to retire and you're going to do absolutely nothing and you're going to be happy because you don't have to work anymore. And I don't think baby boomers feel that way. No. I, I think that all those people were retired that, that felt that way. They want to stay active. They want to stay socially engaged. They want to have meaningful connections. They want a reason to get up out of bed in the morning. It was probably said best. I have a, a half retired client that makes a very good income, a couple million dollars a year. And he's done all the work, and now he doesn't really you know, need to be there. You know, that vital need to be there. He's still needed, but it's just not for as much. And it's for the super uh, high important stuff we call your Picasso work. So he's only doing his Picasso work. But he says, you know, I started to think about it when I first enrolled in the program. And, and he said, what would I do if I half retired? Because he could have sold that for enough money and he had other assets as well. And he goes, 
I'd be killing time going to Walmart with my wife. <laughs> and that's not really how I want to spend my days after being this high powered business guy. Yes. You know, that's not what he wanted to do. And so by half retiring, I think that it allows you to create that work life balance. Forget the money, right? Forget the money for a minute. You, you still get the bonus of keeping your money, but you also keep your company car and all those perks that go with owning a business and your social connections that come with your business and your status as a business owner. You're not just retired business owner, Jim. I'm still CEO of my company, Indeed. not ex-CEO. Mm, incredible, absolutely incredible. And again, uh, are there any misconceptions around the thought of half retiring? other than what we just talked about, that you, you want to demystify? Well, there's some. I, I, so I think that the concept, so I, I think it's a very easy concept to latch onto, right? Oh, work less hard, get off the grind, you know, have more money in the bank. Cool. You know, and, and so it's easy to kind of get that. This sounds like a great idea. Yes. I, I think some of the challenges that we have is that if it was just a matter of having the idea to half retire, A, somebody would have come up with it a long time ago, and B, <laughs> everybody would have done it. Yes. You know, that there's, you know, back to the six steps uh, that we were talking about before, that there's, there's a process that you have to go through to half retire. Indeed. And I think that sometimes there's this misconception that you just need to have the idea. You know, it's like... Um, you know, losing weight. You see the commercials on TV, and they you know, convince me that, uh, that that buying this this gizmo will instantly lose the weight, and I feel a lot better when I buy it. <laughs> but I still have to you know, do the steps in order to make that happen. Absolutely. Now, for those who try to do this, what are the common mistakes, Jim, that you've seen them do? Uh, I think the biggest thing. So we try not to use the word delegation. Right. No, and so, because I think that it's a loaded word, right? And when I say delegation, so back to keep in mind that, that, that we're all a little frustrated as business owners, right? We all have a frustrating day every now and then. <laughs> we wish we would go, why did I do this again? Well, <laughs> uh, it's, just a, it's just a challenge, right? And we get those days, and then you say something to yourself like, you know what? I don't know why I'm doing all this. You know, Wilhausen's right. He, we, I should have retire, and I know what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do it. You're going to do it. I'm going to delegate it to you. Yes. And here's my contention. I'm guessing that anybody that's been in business for more than five minutes understands the concept of delegation and that it means <laughs> somebody else doing it instead of you and that that's usually a pretty good thing. So why are business owners delegating is, is my premise. So, so why, if delegation is so awesome and it would just be as simple as, I'm not going to do it anymore. You're going to do it anymore. Why hasn't everybody done that? Because it's difficult. Like, why are we stuck with all this work? And it's because it's undelegable. Yes. It is undelegable in its current form for a lot of reasons. And this is, you know, part of what we get into in our training is, is it how do you take what we call this hairball of work that, that we all do as business owners every day, and at the center of it is that Picasso work that I was talking about, that work that only you can do. It's your special genius. It's, you know, the art just touching the canvas, as we call it. All the other work can be done by others. But there's other work that attaches itself to your genius. And it ends up just being this hairball of stuff that really is mostly work and could be done another way, right? Another fallacy of delegation is what about delegating it to technology? Right. You know, we get a lot of these older business, oh, I don't like technology. And it's like, yes, you do. You have a smartphone, you watch Netflix, you, you use technology, you, know, you use the internet. There's all kinds of technology that you like, but they kind of have this, um, I need to understand how it works in order to benefit from it. Yeah. And part of the mindset work that we want to do is, no, you don't. You just need to know how to tell time. You don't need to know how to make a watch. Just being able to tell time is enough. And a lot of times you can delegate stuff to technology. Sometimes you can change a process. You can even change the business model, which is a step up from that. Uh, or you can give it to somebody else to do in its current form, but properly sequenced and, and what, we, what we call unbundling. Unbundling that hairball into a bunch of micro tasks and then figuring out how to 
separate the Picasso work from the rest of it, and then offload the other work in pieces rather than trying to hand the hairball to somebody else. And we all know that doesn't work. We've no, all it doesn't. It doesn't. Absolutely. Gosh, it doesn't. So what should business owners do? Maybe we could jump on to talk about the six-step process which you have created. I know we won't be able to finish all of it today, but we can certainly get started. Uh, what should business owners who are listening to this today uh, do if they want to half retire? Sure, and we'll just cover it through the framework of the, of the blueprint. So step one, we call the magnet, all right? And we believe that you have to have a powerful reason to half retire. You know, hey, this would be cool, isn't going to work. I mean, yeah, fine. Take some of the free stuff, borrow some best practices, put them to work. I'm sure your business will be better. But without that fuel, you know, or in this case, the magnet pulling you towards half retirement, it doesn't tend to work. You have to have a reason. Oh, shoot, I just ran the math, and I'm not going to be able to maintain my lifestyle. If I sell my business, that's a magnet, right. Right? right? My personal favorite was had somebody who had promised their spouse that they would retire together. One spouse had a job, one had a business. The one with the job retires. The one with the business, two years later, calls us up and says, I broke my promise to my spouse. I promised them that I would retire two years ago. And now, you know, it's tick tock, tick tock. And I'm ruining my marriage. I'm potentially ruining my marriage yeah. by not keeping this promise. That's a strong magnet. And the work that this person did was amazing. And it's because they had this very strong magnet uh, to get it done. Amazing. Okay, That's usually pr pretty easy. But for instance, there's things that you can do to strengthen your magnet. Right? For instance, probably some people listening to this will go, wow, this sounds like an interesting idea. Great. Go to halfretire.com, check out the website, make sure it's uh, you know something that fits for you. And then they're still feeling it, right? Right. Go tell somebody important to you. Right? People don't do this. You know, if it, let's just keep a simple example of a spouse or a partner. You go and you tell your partner, hey, I found this thing called half retire. I think I, you know, what do you think about me doing that? I promise they're gonna go, sounds like a good idea. Because <laughs> they want to see you more. They want to see you more. The life of a partner of a business owner is not an easy one. <laughs> you know, we, we ask a lot of our partners. I tell you that. I you know that firsthand. <laughs> well, and our children. I mean, I have you know, two. I have two girls. So you know, we ask a lot of them too. Being an entrepreneur's family is not the easiest gig. And so, believe me, the thought of hey, we get to spend more time with you and we get to see you less stressed will be very appealing to them. But that's what we call positive trap, right? Now, if I go tell my partner, hey, I'm thinking about this, she's not going to let me forget six months from now because uh, there's this thing that we call the black hole. Right. And I'm guessing that your business has the same black hole that mine does that all my clients has. And that here's the easiest way to explain this. So um, this manufacturing business I was telling you about, I had about 50 people. And so it was always very chaotic. You're trying to get orders out. You're trying to get you know, supplies in. And it was somewhat tricky because we were uh, beholden to a supply chain that was, let's just say, complicated. And so I used to go in on Saturday mornings. Yes. And you already know why I went in on Saturday mornings. <laughs> I went in because there was no chaos. Right? That's right. Yes. Nobody else was there. I get the place all to myself. And I remember one time, it's probably... Eight o'clock in the morning on Saturday, I put my key in the door and I turn the key. And when the door cracks an inch, I have this overwhelming feeling of euphoria. Right. And I'm like, why do I feel so happy? And I realized that the reason I felt so happy was because I could just work on my stuff and I wouldn't have anybody bugging me and I wouldn't have customers on the phone and I wouldn't have all that chaos that happens Monday morning. Okay. And that is the black hole. I'm, you, know, you go in Monday, right? You made a, on Sunday, you thought about your plan. You go, man, here's what I'm going to do this week. And you got all these strategic things written down. And then by 8.30 on Monday morning, you're off the list, right? Yeah. And it's because that black hole has sucked you in, right? <laughs> and you just can't escape. And some business owners give up. They, <laughs> they, they, they 
they're they're and they're not reactive. What Jimmy, happens, you are talking just, about me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have to work on <laughs> our best work is not reactive. Your highest and best use. I don't need to know the details of your business, but the stuff that makes you the big money, the stuff that you do that's worth a million bucks lifetime value, is not reactive. It is proactive. And if you're sucked in by the black hole, you're not doing any proactive work. Sip of it. That's why you come in on Saturday because you want to do the good stuff. It's, you know, my wife and I came to my office and stared out that window right there <laughs> because she's she's working on some publishing and she was frustrated that she wasn't having time to get it done. And I said, you know, I work Saturdays for this very reason. And so to her credit, she listened to me and, you know, we had a good morning and she felt a million times better by the time that we were done. And it's because we all know that that fuel of the strategic and, you know, our vision for the business requires that special time. If you don't have it, then you just kind of, that's what gets you on the ground. Amazing. It's so true. Uh, truly amazing. Uh, assuming we've got this one covered, uh, what will be the next thing? So then we go to the mindsets. And, and this one, as I was writing the book, uh, surprised me. Uh, I, I knew that it would be part of it, right? Because, like, here's a simple one. So we talk about remapping your mindsets. So if I decided, okay, I'm going to really go full bore with that retirement. I have a good life, and I don't work that hard. But let's say I wanted to go full bore two half days a week, right? Right. There's certain things that I need to change about the way that I run my business. That if I, I can't run my business half retired the same way mentally that I and and operationally the same way that I run it without. It's just not possible. I mean, it's, it's illogical, right? If, if A plus B equals C, but now I want it to be A plus B plus C equals C, it's not going to be the case. We're, we're adding a variable called half retire. The equation changes. And one of the things that needs to change is our mindset. And we need to remap them. So we have a whole, a whole chapter in the book. There's a whole process in our training about how to remap these mindsets. So I'll share one of them. And I'll call it perfectionism to pragmatism. Right. Sometimes people pick on business. Oh, you're just being perfectionistic. And a lot of times that's not true. Perfectionism is a good thing. You're operating on my knee. Please be perfectionistic. <laughs> okay. If we're talking about, you know, getting every order typed properly, that may not be the end of the world if occasionally there was a problem, right? That good enough is good enough for some of this stuff. But, but some business owners struggle with good enough ever being good enough. And you know what that means? You're not going to have to retire. That's what it means. But if, it's, <laughs> if the standard is perfection, and now you're only there two half days a week, I assure you that perfection is only going to happen when you're there. And then you're going to realize it only happens when you're there. And then you're going to stop coming in two half days a week. And you're going to be there because you have to babysit sit this perfection. Right. Now, what we want to do, and I'm jumping ahead, but in, in step four, we talk about, you know, uh, systematizing some of this stuff, right? How do you get a system that can get that same output without your eyes being on it? And uh, the best example I've got for this is Southwest Airlines, which uh, I know flies here more than there. But Southwest Airlines has a reputation of being very, very friendly. They'll joke around, uh, and they're just, they're a happy crowd. Okay, right. Fifty thousand people with smiles on their faces. You know, I'm sure you've been on an airline where there's been a, a, a grumpy steward, right? Where they're just kind of in a bad mood or whatever. If you had someone who was a cabin attendant at Southwest that was a grumpy Gus, let's say, it would not take long for one of their fellow employees to tell them to straighten their route. <laughs> it doesn't need to be enforced by the CEO. Is my point that it's cultural. That the culture is enforcing the norm that Southwest wants. It doesn't need to be enforced by the owner. And then that's part of the process that, that we work on in step four is getting those systems in place, whether they be culture or other, that will drive the results you're used to getting by doing it with your eyeballs. All right. But back to mindsets, we gotta identify the problem ones. There's 30 or 40 that we've identified. And then we need to remap those to a more half retire friendly mindset. Which is, then, uh, say what? Uh, half retire mindset, mindset primarily, which is? 
Well, there's well, so in this case, there's going to be 38 mindsets that are better. So we're saying, listen, perfectionism has its place, but so does pragmatism. So sometimes we need to remap perfectionism to pragmatism. You know, it would be would be one of those would, would be one of those mindsets. You know, we even have a saying that goes with it. You can get things done the way you'd like them done, or you can half retire. <laughs> and that, I mean, I t- that's actually a second one, too. So some of that could be perfectionistic, right? I just like it done this way. That's more the one I'm talking about. There's a lot of ways to accomplish things in the business. And when we're there all the time and it's our business, I can get it done the way I like it done. But if my team can get it done with the same result, in a way that they do better, like better, or more capable of, or whatever, why should I care how they do it? Yes. What I want to do is be the standard bearer and make sure that the standard gets formed, that the customer gets what they want. How the customer gets what they want, I don't really care. But that's a mindset that gets in the way of some people. They want it done the way they want it done, and that's just not conducive to your app retirement. This is amazing. You know, when you talk about it, it becomes so obvious. But if you are not aware of it, you know, you just keep on going, don't you? <laughs> you can, it's like it's like putting on makeup or tying a tie without a mirror. You know, some it, it's very hard. I mean, believe me, if you came into my business, I'm sure you could find ten problems that I can't see because you have fresh eyes. Absolutely, absolutely. So we've covered uh, the mindset and the magnet. Uh, we've covered about systematizing your business. What else should business owners be thinking about uh, if they are going to uh, to take this concept of after retirement? Well, do you want me to go to step three, or you you want to you just go as you feel? <laughs> okay. Well, so step three is probably the most meaty, uh, right. and probably the most of work that some people need to do. Um, have you? Do you have the game? There with the wood blocks? We do, yes. Okay. So if you've ever played that game, you ever uh, push on a piece and the whole tower kind of spins and almost comes over, right? You, you pick a middle piece and you think that piece is really loose and you push it and the whole thing just spins on you and you're like, whoa. Yes, uh, yes. I better not push that. That piece is the business owner. That if you push on that piece, that tower is going to top. Right? right, But if you play the game, you realize that if you remove other pieces, the weight shifts. And then you can come back to that piece that was really stuck and push that piece out easily later. And that's exactly what we're going to do in step three that we call the Jenga step. That mm-hmm. we're going to make it so that that business owner who is stuck, and, it, and they're right. It's that they're feeling like, well, if I'm not here, things are going to fall apart. They're not wrong. You know, I, I don't like, I never liked it when I was a business. Oh, you're exaggerating. You know, you, yeah, I mean, I know you're a smart guy, but are you really that needed? Yeah, there's stuff that's going to go wrong if I just didn't show up for a month. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a feeling. It's not my worry. It's actually true. But that can be fixed. You know, look at these big companies. They, you know, the, the, the CEO doesn't have to be watching everybody every day. Right? And we need to borrow some of those best practices. So we're going to, and, and it depends on how well your business is running. It could be anything from your business model to how many people you have can play a role. Uh, and eventually you'll ask me, can someone with a one person business half retire? And the answer is yes, but it's going to be different than someone that might have 50 or 100 people. Indeed. You know, Indeed. They have more resources at 100 people to, to help them leverage half retirement than I do if I'm just one person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Jim, we are coming towards the end of our time here together, and there is a lot of information here. And uh, from what I'm hearing, there is more to come. Where can we send our listeners to get more information? Yeah, I would just go to the main page of halfretire.com. Obviously, the book's for sale on Amazon. If you just go to Amazon and type in Half Retire, you'll find the book. But on the page, you can get a download of the six steps to the six step blueprint that we're talking about. That's a free download. You can take a free course uh, that is uh, you know short five minute lessons. It's probably about thirty minutes to an hour worth of content. If you want to learn more, great uh, resources to help business owners. And if you want to dig in deeper, we certainly have coaches that can work with people. Uh, you know, we have what we call the full boot camp that has all of this story detail that I'm talking about. 
in it so you can really leverage the value of this asset that a lot of people have spent 20, 30 years building. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. One of the things that you mentioned earlier on was mastermind. You you were involved or you're still involved in mastermind. I know a lot of our audience are looking at mastermind right now because we have a program we are promoting on mastermind. You know, what has been the most valuable thing you have uh, gained from a mastermind setting? Yeah, I am. Uh, you're not going to be. I'm going to be an easy sell on this because I, I, I was a buyer at this for five years. In the last five years, I owned my business, and I think that the biggest value is, I think business owners are receptive to the opinions of other business owners, even more so than yours and mine. And I'm sure you've learned this already that you learn to check your ego and not worry about that. But you are going to get insights that you would never see. Because you can't, that's like tying your own tie or putting on your own makeup. You just can't see it. It's not that you're stupid. It's not that you don't understand. It's not that you don't have a PhD or an MBA. It's that you are you. And just like the doctor shouldn't operate on their own family, sometimes the business owner shouldn't operate on their own business. And it takes, you know, outsiders. I also find that the accountability is really helpful. Um, I, I am of the opinion that you cannot hold yourself accountable. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm sure you're a hard charger like I am, and I'm go, 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 go. But at some point, if I don't want to do it, guess what? I'm not going to do it. That's right. That's not accountability. Accountability is getting you to do something you don't want to do, not, not you know, pushing you harder on what you do want to do. And I, I have found that the group can hold people much more accountable in, you know, a positive way than you could do yourself or even a one-on-one coach could do uh, because it's just more voices. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you again, Jim, for being here on the show. Awesome. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Jim sharing his special knowledge with you. I'm excited about how you're going to apply this knowledge and how that is going to bring good results in your business and also in your personal life. Now, Jim and I have agreed to put on a special training for you if you want to carry on learning about this subject and how you can apply his concepts in your business uh, today. So if you want to learn more about that, click the link below and you'll be taken to that special registration page and registered there for this particular training. On a different subject, if you still haven't registered for the Mastermind, uh, register today so that you can be part of the new uh, group that we are registering today. And also, remember, if you've got anything you want to learn about, uh, tell us in our group there on LinkedIn, and we'll be able to incorporate it in our episodes. With that said, have a great day, and I look forward to spending another quality time with you very soon. Thank you for listening to Ukai Business Show. We will be back to bring you more episodes with success stories and advice straight from the experts. Want more? Check out www.